Well, many of us in the congregation have started the new year by reading in the book of 1 Kings, and I'm going to be looking with you this morning at some of the words in 1 Kings about Solomon and his wisdom, and that wisdom that God gave him in a variety of areas of life. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Now that's a pretty big offer. Whatever. A blank check. Tell me what you want. Just think about what you might say if you had that offer, if you could just make one wish. You know, there's always those stories of the genie in the bottle, you know, where you rub the bottle and you get three wishes or one wish or whatever. Here's a wish that wasn't just a genie, but a real offer. Solomon answered, you have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. This is a pattern that has happened elsewhere in the Bible. Moses, when God called him to bring the people out of Egypt, said he wouldn't be able to do it. In that case, Moses went too far. Uh, he used it as an excuse that he really wasn't qualified. Solomon didn't quite go so far as to use it as an excuse, but he did say, this is a big job, this is a great people, and I don't feel that I've got what it takes to rule them as my father did. Later on, the prophet Jeremiah was called, and he said, Oh, Lord, I'm only a child. And you see that among a lot of God's people, where when they were called to something great, they didn't say, Well, you know, come to think of it, I can see why you picked me, um, being so well qualified for the job, and the job being such an easy or unimportant thing to do anyway. Um, Solomon looks at it and says, This is a great people. They are chosen by you. And I don't know how I can do it. And those of us who have even held lesser positions than Solomon uh, may have had this feeling at times. I know when, as a father, having my first children, I thought, oh, no. Now when I blow it, it affects them too. Sometimes when you're a young adult and don't have any children yet, uh, sometimes you're a little dense and don't realize what impact your actions might have on your parents or on your friends. But a lot of the time you just think, you know, uh, the only person I'm hurting is me if I blow it. Uh, that, that's never true. But it certainly isn't true when you have children under your care. And, and when, you have, when you're a person like Solomon being put in a high position like that, if he is a blockhead, it will hurt lots and lots of people and undermine what his father had done and weaken um, the people that God had chosen. So whatever it is that you're looking to do, take seriously the consequences and realize that you need divine help and guidance to undertake such a calling. The big request is this, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? What a tremendous request. He wants a discerning heart, a wise heart, to know what the right choices are going to be and the wrong choices are going to be, to know the difference between right and wrong, and also in just making individual decisions. What's the right decision? What's the wrong decision? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, 
both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. But not just a dream. Um, God gave him that wisdom. And God gave him all of those fringe benefits that God had said he would. And so as you read on in the book of Kings, you read about the splendor of Solomon's kingdom, the prosperity of that kingdom, the tremendous um, shrewdness and wisdom that Solomon himself had, that fabulous throne that he built with lions on the six steps leading up to it and all of the attendants and the great feasts they had. Uh, God said he would give Solomon wisdom plus, and he did. Now, I want to begin by focusing on the fact that it all begins with spiritual wisdom. Nowadays, of course, it's a little too trendy to just talk about spirituality, but I'm using spiritual as a word that refers to building on God and on godliness. Uh, as Proverbs itself says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And God's promise through James is that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. So you might say, boy, that would really be cool to be Solomon and be offered just one thing and kind of have that blank check, and then God would give it to me. Well, James is saying, you know, if you were going to ask in the same ballpark as Solomon, you'll get it. If you need wisdom, just ask God, and he'll give you the degree of wisdom that you need in your circumstances. And above all, of course, that, that heavenly wisdom that, that comes from God that directs us in all our ways. So we're going to talk about a variety of kinds of wisdom that Solomon had and that the Lord um, encourages us in, but we want to understand what the foundation of it is. There are many different dimensions of wisdom, but... They count only if they're built on that foundation of the fear of the Lord and wisdom as God's gift. Solomon had political wisdom. And that political wisdom did not always make him a nice guy. Those of you who have read the first few chapters of Kings realize that it was not really a good idea to be on the wrong side of Solomon or to be launching little schemes to take over from him. He could smell that kind of stuff a mile away, and if he did, you were done. Uh, his half-brother Adonijah wanted, tried it once, and it blew up in his face. He still had a, this big ego, though. You, know, you maybe remember that verse where he said, you know, all Israel wanted me to be king, but things changed. You know, that's how he summarized it. Um, actually, when you read about the actual coronation, he had his own group of people, and he got his own men to make a lot of noise. But the whole city of Jerusalem was yelling when Solomon was crowned king. But that and I just had it in his head that all Israel really thought he was a great guy and wanted him to be king. And he wasn't going to give up on that dream. He angled to try to get the beautiful young woman Abishag who had been with David and thought that would really strengthen his claim to the throne. And he asked Solomon's mother to help him with that. And she was not quite as shrewd a politician as her son. And she didn't see what he was up to, but Solomon did. And um, Adonijah was dead. His co-conspirator Joab was dead. Um, Solomon had his enforcer, Benaiah, take care of all that. And you didn't see too many people trying to um, grab Solomon's throne from him because he could see that stuff coming and he dealt with it pretty harshly. Now, he was a shrewd politician in that respect. He was also good at making pacts and treaties with surrounding countries. He was not one who just thought, you know, if I'm really nice and profess to be a peaceful person, we will all live in peace. He armed his border cities to the teeth, and he built up Israel's strength. And one reason he never had any wars was because nobody wanted to take him on. And so he had a political wisdom that was shrewd in the ways that a fallen world actually works, and he was able to maintain that. And, of course, that famous story that we read about the difficult request. Two women come to him, and, and one claims that 
that the other one laid on her baby and that it died, and then in the middle of the night, she came and swiped her living baby. Well, how do you figure that one out? You know, they both claim to be the mother. The DNA tests are a couple of millennia off yet. And so what do you do? And Solomon says, ah, bring in a sword, chop the kid in half, and give him each half. That sounds really equitable and fair. And the one woman says, it sounds fair to me. <laughs> and, and the other one says, no, no, just give her the kid. And of course, as you know, Solomon um, gave the child to the right mother. Now, that works once. <laughs> you, that's not the kind of thing you can do every time there's a dispute. Is say, well, chop somebody in half and divvy him up. It worked on that occasion. And sometimes that's how wisdom works. Uh, you can't just take a, a complete formula, but with God's help and God's wisdom, you, you have a notion of what's going to work this time uh, in that situation. And Solomon had that kind of intuition and, and skill in judgment in, in a great degree. And so he was an effective king, politician, judge, ruler. He had political wisdom. He also had economic wisdom. 1 Kings 4, just a couple of selected verses from there. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate and drank and they were happy. Now, they didn't consider um, the blessing of children to be a serious curse. When they were numerous as the sand on the seashore, they saw that as a really good thing. And Solomon, one of the few songs that we have of his is Psalm 127. And he knew that that in economics and in family life and in the growth of population, the Lord's blessing is what can bring that about. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and work late, toiling for food to eat because he grants sleep to those he loves. So in economic life and, and in prosperity, um, it was going to be the Lord's blessing that would bring that about. The children are a heritage from the from the Lord, says Psalm 127. Um, children are a gift from him. Blessed is the one whose quiver is full of them. Solomon, according to the heading of Psalm 127, wrote those words. And so it was that kind of wisdom and that kind of ruler he wanted. He measured the success of his kingship in many respects by how numerous the people would become, by whether the ordinary people prospered. Not just by how big a palace he could get, but by how the total... Um, well-being of his nation was. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms west of the river and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. Now, under his own vine and fig tree, people, all the families in Israel had been given an inheritance in the land to pass along. And also, you read that phrase, under his own vine and under his own fig tree, maybe the uh, best modern translation would be they had it made in the shade. You know, they're sitting under their tree just eating the fruit, enjoying the shade on a, on a sunny day. Uh, these were people who were enjoying life. And that again is a, is a measure of, of blessing and of good leadership. Um, good leadership is not just how big of monuments you can build in Washington, D.C., or whatever your capital city happens to be. It's what's happening in the, whether the people actually have it made in the shade right in their own lives and in their own homes. Uh, Solomon had wide-ranging wisdom. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. If they did IQ tests, then, that, you know, you just don't have numbers for that. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the East and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. You know, it's well, rendering hard cases of judgment, running the military, administering the economy. You know, I think in my spare time I'll write a few thousand proverbs. And, you know, while I'm at it, yeah, I, a thousand songs isn't quite enough, maybe a few more. Um, he described, you know, that's not quite enough either. We, we've got to have a little science here. He described plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also taught about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Now, Solomon was a genius. He was, um, 
exploring all of these areas, I figured probably that as a king and as a very skilled administrator, he probably also had teams of people researching in these areas and doing work on, on his behalf and bringing him some of the fruit of their work that he'd bring together. But however he did it, he was exploring a lot of different areas of thought and of life. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. And one of the rulers that came to him, as the Bible tells us, was the Queen of Sheba. Off in her kingdom, she'd been hearing rumors that there's this King Solomon, and this guy is something else. He is a genius. And, and she thought, oh, come on. I know there's you know, kings who have some ability, but th these stories are kind of tall tales. So she decided she was going to visit Solomon, and she took along some nice gifts, and spent some time talking with him and asking him hard questions and just probing, how much does this guy really know? And when she got done with that, she says, well, king, I got to admit, when I came here, huh, I didn't believe that I was going to find what I'd been hearing about. Uh, I thought nobody could be like that. But now that I've seen it and heard you, you're twice as smart as I heard. You know, the half of it wasn't told me. I, I've, I've heard you speak. I've seen how you've got your kingdom arranged, how your court is run. And, uh, you know, I wasn't even told half of it. So the Bible tells us that he just wowed everybody whom he met. Now, there's a few things that need to be emphasized just as an overall theme. And that is that God gives multidimensional wisdom. We take Solomon, the wisest king... God gave him ability in a lot of different areas of life and a keen interest in those different areas of life. In the age in which Solomon ruled and in the life of Israel, its golden age, the nation flourished in various areas of life, not just in their spiritual walk with God, but in a lot of different areas of life. And so the vision that God has for, for the human mind as well as for a society really comes through in that. And Christians should value education, not just in memorizing principles about God, though certainly learning the truths of, of God and the doctrines of the Trinity or of atonement are very vital, but Christians should value education in all areas of life because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we should do whatever we can in the areas that God calls us into to help those areas of life flourish. It's a very great mistake to simply look at the world in purely spiritual terms and say we have nothing to do with the rest of the world. There's, there's a view of being worldly which kind of shuns the, the whole world that God has made and that is not what the Bible means when it warns against worldliness. When it war warns against worldliness, it's warning against loving the world more than God, but it's also warning particularly against the world in rebellion against God. It's not warning against God's good creation or the various dimensions of life or becoming a very small-minded, narrow-minded person who knows almost nothing about anything and prides himself on it. You know, to be anti-intellectual or anti-being involved in our society and in the various dimensions of life is a very great mistake. And sometimes there are even ways of thinking that can contribute to that mistake. If you look at the world as just a mess that's doomed, rather than as a world that is ruled by God in which he's going to work his purposes, if you just see it as a wreck, um, why would you want to rearrange deck chairs or polish brass on the Titanic? You know, it's going down. You know, we might as well just forget about it. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God reigns. Things happen in their own times and seasons. God is the ruler of history. And even when he does come and purify the creation and make all things new, the Bible speaks of the wealth of the nations and of kings being brought into his kingdom and of rich cultural treasures being made part of the new creation. And so somehow in ways we might not quite understand God incorporates the ways that his people are involved in culture now and redeems that too and exalts it. And so we should take Solomon and many other examples as well as teachings from the Bible as a cue not 
to write off the world that God has made, not to say, oh, we really should just ignore what goes on in history and look forward to Christ's coming. Of course we look forward to Christ's coming. But we know that Christ has already come and that the kingdom of God is already among us and that God is already at work among us. Now, I want to look at some of these areas in which God gave Solomon such wisdom and in which Christianity and the teachings of the word of God continue to provide tremendous wisdom. One is simply the relationship between the scriptures and Christianity and government. There are a good many nations in the world today where there is still little or no freedom, where there is still very little economic prosperity. And there can be a variety of factors for that, a variety of reasons, but the fact is that the scriptures and the rule of God have laid the groundwork for better government. One is simply that we always, as Christians, believe that rulers are under God's authority. This is a different thing. In the ancient Near East and in other parts of the world, there was a view that rulers were gods. Now this makes a difference in how they rule. If you are the God, then what you say goes. And you just make it up as you go along, and you don't have to answer to anybody because you're the big cheese. You're the God. And fooey on all those little underlings. Take the pyramids of Egypt. They've lasted a long time. Oh, they're very impressive. But think about what they really represent. They represent a guy who is willing to make thousands of slaves work and sweat and die to build him a grave. Okay? One guy wastes the lives of thousands of people for one monument to himself. Is that the kind of rule that you would like to have as, as your government? Somebody who enslaves you for his own ego? Um, rulers who are under God have to respect the God-given rights of their fellow citizens who are under God. And the rule of law means that God's law is higher than any man-made law, and any rule of man that is in conflict with God's doesn't hold water. And that, again, is a very sharp curb on the power of government. The separate governance of church and state, which is a very different thing than saying government is separate from God. God's got to stay out of government. I'm sorry about that. God doesn't stay out of anything just because we want him to. But God did, from Israel's earliest days give orders that the priesthood be separate from the governing civil authority. And when um, government tried to get into that, for example, when a guy who was otherwise quite godly decided that he was going to be the one to offer incense in God's temple and do the work of the priest, God struck him with leprosy. Uh, there was a very clear separation between what kings could do and what priests could do, and that laid the groundwork for this separation. Part of it maybe also was just God heading off that temptation for kings to declare themselves gods and make themselves divine. There was also, uh, if Christianity says that a ruler is under God, what does he rule for? Well, you see, in Solomon's words even, who had much more absolute power in many respects than we would want a ruler to have, nonetheless, Solomon was very conscious that his job was to seek the people's well-being. He says, oh man, who could rule this great people of yours? And how can he arrange things so that things are good under the vines and the fig trees? You know, that's, how, that's the measure of a good king. And so, you know, the palace, he built a fabulous palace. He went overboard, I think. But, you know, you can put up with a king with a good palace if everybody also has it made in the shade at their own place. And so he really understood that he had to seek people's well-being. And once again, this is not the rule, but often the exception among human rulers. They think that they're in there uh, because they're important. The people are there to line their own pockets. You hear again and again of, of political figures who've got billions of dollars in their own private accounts while their nation languishes in poverty, and what a difference it makes. Even when government doesn't acknowledge God fully anymore, the fact that Christian principles have been kind of drilled into people over the centuries means that they just won't put up with those kind of phony claims. The rule of law was very important from the beginning. Um, 
God said through Moses that when a king takes the throne, he's to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, and he's to hang on to that thing and read it all his life. And the reason for that is that he not consider himself better than his brothers. He is just as responsible to obey God as the lowest of the people whom he governs. He did not consider himself better than his brothers, or not to turn from the law to the right or to the left. And even in the American Declaration of Independence, where do rights come from? We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. This sense that we are responsible to the same Creator and blessed by the same Creator. And without those limits on government, you get kings and rulers who think they can do just about anything. It's just a fact that in most nations of the world where there's the greatest degree of political freedom today, they have a Christian heritage. Um, I'm not saying that they're all Christian by a long shot. Many times they're living on borrowed capital, and the nation may have left a lot of its Christian principles behind, but is still benefiting from them. Christianity and prosperity. Now, you all know that I'm a prosperity preacher, that you can name it and claim it, and if you believe it hard enough, great things are going to happen to you, and that you will never get sick, and your bank accounts will always be overflowing if you just have enough faith and if you're godly. Well, maybe not. Um, you've maybe heard me blast the prosperity preachers a good many times, and I'm not fond of that prosperity gospel at all. The Bible warns against the notion that godliness is a means to financial gain, and that you're just kind of angling into the God business to line your pockets and really get rich. And, and you think that God would never send illness or hardship into the life of a good person. You know, people like Job and Jesus, you know, we're quite superior to them. Uh, well, come on, you know, get a grip. The, if, if such great saints of God could suffer, then we can count on many difficulties and tribulations. And so the prosperity gospel, as it's often preached, is just very deceptive and wrong. But having said all that, it is a fact that in a society where justice largely prevails, and in a society where people are living by God's principles, Generally, good things will happen to that economy, and good things will happen in terms of the prosperity of those people. Now, there are situations in unjust societies where you're living for the Lord, where you actually get poorer and face persecutions for following the Lord's ways, and, and so on. But the fact is that when Israel had a good king, and when they were living by God's principles, good things happened, and still in today's society, basic principles that are taught us in the scriptures, principles of righteousness, of making proper choices between right and wrong, are all other things being equal going to lead in the direction of heading you off from a lot of troubles in your life and making it more prosperous. One is stable marriages. Now, a simple statistic in North America is this. If you do three things, if you get married and stay married, if you don't have children before 20, and if you finish high school, you have an 8% chance of being below the poverty line by the time you're 40. Now, even the poverty line, of course, in the United States does not mean you're starving or that all is lost. But you have a very low probability if you just do those simple things, you know, finish high school, learn some basic skills, stay married, and don't have babies when you're barely a baby yourself. Now. If you don't follow those three of staying married and, and of, of not having children too early and of finishing your education, you have a 78% chance of being below the poverty line. Now again, don't despise people who live below the poverty line. Uh, our calling is to bless those in times of need. But it is a fact that in a country as prosperous as ours, which has as an ordered economy, there are certain just ways of either getting real poor or of doing okay. Now, in biblical teaching, two of the Ten Commandments protect property. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If somebody has something that you wish you had, you don't say, well, I'm taking it. You can't do that because it's theirs and it's not yours. And not only that, you can't look at it and resent it. And just say, 
Well, I'm not going to steal it, but boy, I wish I could grab it and resent them. Instead, if, if there is something else and if it's worth having, then you might give some thought, now, how can I have something similar? Uh, you know, is there a plan? Uh, you know, is there a certain kind of training or of work or of opportunity that I could seize? Maybe, maybe there is. If so, then you work for it rather than trying to steal it or resenting that they have it. And if it isn't um, within your range of possibilities, then you live with it. And you say, well, you know, Bill Gates may have a gazillion. I'm not ever going to have that. Um, good for Bill. I don't think I need it. Um, and so you, you make your own choices. But, but the fact is that the Bible protects property. Now, that, that can get carried away where, where super rich people are so selfish and, and spending only on their own luxuries. That can be very wicked. The Bible has plenty to say about that, too. But it doesn't say, let's just abolish all ownership of anything. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels did. They summarized um, the Communist Manifesto by saying, you know, what it all boils down to is this, the abolition of private property. We all know how well that worked out. Um, you, one way to abolish private property is kill those who own anything. Um, we've even seen a modern example of it again uh, in, I believe, Zimbabwe, where Mugabe just takes the land away from the people who had been farming it because he wants to do political favors to other people, so then he winds up with a famine. Yeah, because you know what? Sometimes farmers actually know how to farm. And if you stick some nitwit on it that doesn't know anything about farming, that land doesn't do very well. So you have, when you just wipe out all property and, and pay no attention to that, you're going to have a pretty poor and hungry country. The dignity of work. The Bible teaches that all work, when it's done for the Lord, is worthwhile doing. And no job is too low. There are some that are too low because they're wicked. You know, it's not saying, you know, be a pornographer, you know, great work. Um, but, but any honest work that does a necessary job is worth doing. Now, among the Greeks and Romans, that kind of work was just left to slaves. And if you were a great person or an intellectual and so on, one of the signs of that was you didn't lift a finger to do anything. I remember um, some visitors who came to our ranch from another country. We, we had some good cattle, and they wanted to see, and we had you know, registered pedigreed cattle. So they came there, but one of them commented that they were amazed that my dad and the rest of us brothers would actually work. You know, you carry sprinkler pipe or you shovel this or that. It, oh, man, why would you, you don't work? That's for the peons. And that, that low view of work is not the way to prosper an economy. Now, you, in that kind of a situation, you may have some super rich people who can enslave others and make things happen for themselves. But the country as a whole just has an economy that keeps going down. In our own country with slavery, Slaves don't work as hard as free people do who have something to benefit from it. And their employers don't treat them the same way as when you have to treat people right or they'll leave and work for somebody else. And in an economy where you have to treat your workers right and when the workers have something to gain from it, well, overall, it goes better. Christians believe that time is a precious gift, that you don't just fritter it away or waste it, but that you use it. And you use it well. And this, again, has an overall um, good effect on how productive people are. Trustworthiness and transparency, that you're honest about what's going on and you can trust it. That's true in just a one-to-one -one transaction where the Bible, for example, says you've got to use honest weights and measures. They would use these balance scales with stuff on one side and on the other side to kind of weigh how much you're getting. So you could cheat and you could make your weights, you know, let's say it says five pounds. You stuff it with lighter stuff so that the five pound weight weighs three and a half. And then you put your three and a half pounder on that side of the scale and then you put the material on the other side. Then you sell them five pounds worth of material. You know, th this is how you rip people off. But when they find out, it doesn't go so well. Um, and when a whole economy is done dishonestly, it can't flourish. The same is true of markets. If everybody was an Enron where they're cooking the books, where the corporations are just being totally dishonest in what they say about what's happening, <laughs> nobody's going to invest in the stock market anymore and, and fund the corporations. Uh, you're not going to trust anybody in the exchange of money, and you will have a terrible economy. You look at a bunch of the economies in Africa, that is exactly what the problem is. Nobody can trust the setup because the businesses and the government are so corrupt that you cannot have 
free and honest exchange, and that just kills an economy. Obvious things like, uh, you know, if your workers are showing up on the job drunk two-thirds of the time or not showing up because they're at home with a hangover, this doesn't really prosper your business. Um, and, and another thing, when you know that God is with you and you go through a hard time or your finances are bad or you've lost a job, you can be tempted to go into a pity party, and all of us may do that to some degree when we're licking our wounds, but when you believe in the sovereignty of God, you say, well, I, God had a purpose even in that, and so where is he leading me from here? And you get up off the ground again, and you have persistence in continuing. Now, these are all things that you're not doing just for the sake of getting rich. You're honest because honesty is right. You don't give up because despair is wrong. You work because God calls us to work with all our hearts as unto the Lord. But when you do all that, um, it tends to make a living for you. And when you don't, it tends to hurt you and it tends to hurt an overall economy. So you'll find that even in the world today, many of the economies, I, you know, I don't want to equate wealth with goodness as <laughs> some of our prosperity preachers do. But the fact is that where there has been a groundwork laid in countries by a Christian tradition of work and of honesty in, in exchange, you will find a, a much greater degree of prosperity than in many other nations. Now in Christianity and the art, Solomon of course famous for building that fabulous temple and his even more fabulous palace. I think he went overboard because even the Bible puts those two statements together. It took him th seven years to build the temple, 13 years to build his palace. I wonder whether he got a little overboard on that 13 year palace. But anyway, Solomon was certainly somebody who valued art and architecture, had some splendid craftsmen and artists working for him. And throughout history, um, those things have been valued by Christian people. We value beauty. Uh, we value beauty in the worship of the Lord. Now, this, this church is hardly a cathedral. I sometimes describe it as a glorified machine shed because it looks like, a lot like my dad's, you know, with the metal building and all of that. Not every church um, is a cathedral, but Christians ha have built some splendid things, maybe at times overly splendid when it could have been spent on others, but at other times, you know, lasting and beautiful things. Uh, we take great artists and sculptors, whether Michelangelo or, or somebody else, and, and we see tremendous gifts of God in the area of art and architecture. In music, um, Solomon wrote a bunch of songs. He's not the last guy to be a little bit interested in music who was given wisdom from the Lord. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach is often considered um, the greatest of musical geniuses because of the amazing uh, pieces that he composed, also because of his contribution to the use of all fingers on the keyboard and, and things that prior to that just hadn't been happening. And, and many other great, great musicians in the area of poetry and proverbs and literature and drama. In the English language, nobody would argue against Shakespeare being the foremost um, writer and dramatist. And not everything he did was uh, stellar in its Christianity. But Shakespeare, uh, when he was speaking of the time of his death, said, I commit my soul unto my creator and, and rest entirely on the mercies of Jesus Christ. He was not just a guy who was out there ignoring the things of God entirely. And whether it's earlier works by, uh, you know, such as Beowulf or, or the Canterbury Tales, I mean, many of the great monuments of English literature simply wouldn't exist without Christian influence. Things, of course, like John Bunyan, Pilgrim's Progress is very explicitly Christian and yet also an amazing work of literature and imagination. A lot of them get it from the Bible itself. Um, Goethe, who was one of the greatest writers in the German language, one of the great geniuses of all time, said, you want to know what the greatest short story in all of world literature is? The Book of Ruth. He said it, it is the best constructed um, short piece of literature in the world. Um, Charles Dickens, who also wrote a few books of his own, uh, when he, he said the greatest story in all the world is the parable of the prodigal son. He, he thought it was the perfect, you know, aside from, of, of course, its meaning, but he thought it was just the perfect story and the way it was put together. And, that, of course, that's inspired uh, many, many amazing writings. If you were a Russian, of course, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, maybe those are just names to some of you. Maybe those are amazing works of literature 
that those men produced to others of you. I think um, the brothers Karamazov is maybe the greatest novel ever written, um, but uh, you got to have a little bit of a stomach to read it. Uh, you know, it, it's long, as all the Russians are, but it's good. Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, the, what a tremendous author he was, who came to Christ in prison and exposed the evils of the Soviet gulag. Uh, so, art, literature, drama, the Lord calls us into those areas. Now, I'll, you're not Solomon. If you're fabulous in government, it's probably pretty likely for most of you that you're not going to be a great poet. I guess John Milton was. Um, he worked for the cabinet, uh, you know, in England and also wrote Paradise Lost. So, you know, there are some people who can do it, but many of us have lesser gifts and they're focused more in one area or in another. But the point is, whatever areas God gives you a calling in, go for that calling and don't write it off and, and think that the only thing that matters is the churchy kind of stuff. In Christianity and the arts, of course, C.S. Lewis and um, J.R.R. Tolkien pioneered great works of imagination in more recent times. Lewis described his view of authorship this way. He says, our whole destiny seems to lie in acquiring a fragrance that is not our own, but borrowed, in becoming clean mirrors filled with the image of a face that's not ours. An author should never conceive himself as bringing into existence beauty or wisdom which did not exist before, but simply and solely trying to embody in terms of his own art some reflection of eternal beauty and wisdom. Lewis knew that in some modern artists valued creativity and originality so highly, they thought that if they came up with anything beautiful, they were the inventor of it. And, Lewis, and they thought the world was basically uh, an absurd, ugly, randomly evolved thing, but they, by their artistic genius, would actually bring something good. And Lewis said, phooey on that. Uh, you know, the world has much beauty already uh, put into it by the Creator, and, and any gift of authorship or of art or anything else is to reflect the eternal beauty and wisdom in some small way. Christianity and science, we know those two are opposites, and that faith um, is completely the opposite of good science and research, but it may be time to rethink that one a little bit. Um, Solomon was a, a great early scientist from what the Bible says. He studied the plants. He studied the animals. He was interested in them all. He, he'd study the dumb little plant growing out of a wall or a little lizard. Uh, nothing was, was unimportant for his studies. And when you think about Christianity and science, I, I, I may just do a whole sermon on that whole area next week because it is such an important area to think through. But just briefly, how do you go about science? Why do you even believe you can learn and understand anything in the first place? If there is no pattern or design in the things outside you, you are wasting your time trying to understand them. There are people nowadays who say, oh, intelligent design is not a scientific concept. You mean there's no pattern to look for? Well, good luck in your science. There is nothing to know if there is no pattern, if there is no design. Oh, by the way, if your brain is a randomly evolved blob of meat, do you have any reason to think that it can know anything at all that is valid about the external world? If it is the random firing of neurons and little electrical impulses inside a randomly evolved hunk of junk, there is no reason to count on that thing. But if there is a great mind who created a world according to certain patterns, and if that great mind made some little minds that could get at least something of those patterns, well then, you know, it's kind of worth looking into things and thinking about them. And the fact is Christianity was not the enemy of science. It was in a Christian context that science arose in the first place because Christians believed that the world had patterns and that we had minds that corresponded in some way with those patterns. And even anti-Christian thinkers who have researched just the history of the mind and the history of science will say science arose in a Christian context and probably would not have risen without it. Now they like to go on to say, but of course it can plow straight ahead now and leave behind those kind of primitive roots of science. But, you know, if 
it, it is becoming more and more common in, in what's called postmodernism and its view of how the mind works that we can't know anything anymore. And both of the guys I'm studying for my doctoral dissertation, C.S. Lewis and Leslie Newbig, and both of them said, you know, I wonder how long science is going to last if these trends in casting off belief in God and in an ordered world are thrown away. The scientific age could come to an end if people stop believing in human rationality and in a patterned world. So um, Christianity is the, is the basis on which uh, the ability to understand our world rests. God, you know, at the very beginning appointed Adam and Eve to name and rule the creation. Science is all about naming, about understanding, giving a name to, and then uh, directing God's creation. And scripture laid the groundwork for that. Now, that doesn't mean that only Christians can be scientists and have any skill, or that only Christians can be artists. God gives his, you know, he sends his reign on the just and the unjust. He sometimes sends genius on the just and on the unjust. There are, there are some great scientists who are not Christians. There are great artists. You can go back very early to the book of Genesis, Lamech's family. He was a bozo. You know, he wrote one of the first poems that's known to the world, and it was about a murder he committed. Well, that's a great poet, isn't it? And his kids, you know, one of them domesticated livestock. Another one uh, invented metal, use of metal implements and instruments and tools. Another was the great father of music and, and the use of musical instruments. And so God gives gifts in these areas, and sometimes Christians can even benefit from things that unbelievers have produced in these areas. But the patterns and the skills and the wisdom for it all comes from God. Just a, a couple of quickies on science. A couple of minor scientists named Copernicus and Newton. Uh, Copernicus was the one who came to understand that the sun is at the center of the solar system and that it doesn't revolve around the earth. Well, he said the universe has been wrought for us by a supremely good and orderly creator. Science is a loving duty to seek the truth in all things insofar as God has granted that to human reason. Isaac Newton, who uh, discovered the universal laws of gravitation and wrote the formulas for that, who in his spare time invented calculus, much to the chagrin of later math students. And, uh, you know, he, he was just a genius in many areas of life. He also wrote more than a million words about Bible exegesis, by the way. He wasn't always orthodox in his doctrines, but he was a very careful student of the Bible as well as a, as a great scientist. He said, no sciences are better attested than the religion of the Bible. Atheism is so senseless. So anyway, um, I, I trust you'll see that not every scientist thinks atheism is a great idea. Now, I want to wrap just by reminding you again to put first things first. Solomon had all of these massive gifts and this stupendous wisdom, and it all began with that humble prayer to God and the realization that he didn't have what it took apart from God's help. But Solomon started marrying and getting in love with some women he shouldn't have, he built some temples to their gods. He started heading in a different direction. And he laid the, he, I can't say he laid the foundation. He, he put fissures and cracks in his foundation, basically, for the kingdom. And it split under his son Rehoboam. And it wasn't all just Rehoboam's boneheadedness. Solomon had made choices. And God had said to him, because of that, I'm going to tear away most of the kingdom from you. Even though he had all these tremendous gifts, he forgot the one thing most needful, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and casting off all idols and all sin. Now, Ecclesiastes appears to have been written by Solomon, so we have good reason to think that after Solomon's uh, stupidities, he, and Ecclesiastes is written by a genius who's had it all and seen it all and richer than anybody imaginable, uh, most likely Solomon because he calls himself son of David and king in Jerusalem. He goes through all that and then at the end he says, you know, without, you know, just under the sun without God, it's all a waste, but fear God and keep his commandments because that's the whole duty of man. That's what it's all about. We've talked about the value of, of a total worldview, of being involved in every area of life, but it has to flow out of the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord and a heart for the Lord. Jesus put it best. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. 
And speaking of Jesus, Solomon was a man of extraordinary wisdom and, and power and glory and wealth. If the Son of God had come to earth as Solomon or somebody kind of like him, you know, with all of that riches, it would have been a tremendous come down for him. You know, being God of the universe to being merely a Solomon, you know, it was quite a loss. And, but as you know, he went a lot lower than Solomon. He was born and laid in that manger, was raised by a peasant parents, the son of a carpenter. He, his wisdom was exercised in a different manner than Solomon's. And yet, what did Jesus say? A greater than Solomon is here. And if rulers and, and great people from all over the earth would come to hear Solomon's wisdom, what are you going to do when a greater than Solomon has come with his supreme wisdom? And so seek in Jesus Christ that wisdom. He is the wisdom of God. In him all things do hold together. And he's the source of wisdom in all of these other areas of life. So put first things first. Your relationship to Jesus Christ. And then out of that relationship, out of that relationship with Christ, the one through whom all things were made, you begin to understand all those things he made. And you begin to understand your calling and which of those things you can help to flourish. So let's, let's seek God's face and ask for his wisdom. Father, we thank you for the, the account of Solomon, for his reign. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us, too, to be people who trust in Jesus, the one far greater than Solomon, in Christ, the wisdom of God. And we pray, Lord, that where each of us has opportunities and gifts, we may seize those, and by the working of your Holy Spirit, have that wisdom that is peaceful and, and wise. We ask, Father, that where we have difficulties in our lives right now or hard decisions to make or, or tasks to tackle that seem too much for us, that you will encourage our hearts with this message, that you may also simply help us to see the grand sweep of history and the way that you are Lord of all history and of all things and encourage us in that and then help us to live in light of that to make a difference. Help those of us, Lord, who are students, who are either studying at home or in institutions, to realize what a tremendous value and privilege it is to learn and to keep on learning about you and the world you have made and our place in it and our ability to influence and affect it and make us mighty for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.